Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Ali at Berkeley's speaker series, Friday speaker series. Um, I will be the moderator today. My name is Matt Shears. I'm the curriculum coordinator at Ali. Today we have uh, Michael Baker, Dr. Michael Baker, and Anastasia Adele in conversation about the war in Ukraine. This is our fall update uh, of a conversation we began a couple of months ago. Dr. Michael Baker recently returned from his th third tour in Ukraine, where he taught advanced trauma life support to Ukrainian physicians and stopped the bleed to civilians. He was working on behalf of the International Medical Corps and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which are NGOs. And Anastasia Adele is an acclaimed author, writer, social historian, and New York Times contributor. She's the author of Russia, Putin's Playground, a Concise Guide to Russian History, Politics, and Culture. And they can take it away. Thank you. Good, thank you, Matt, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna do a quick review of the invasion. I'm gonna go fairly fast. The thing I find most distressing today is that the events in Ukraine have been pushed out of the news cycle. And I'm hoping as we get to the end of our time, we can discuss the reasons about that. Um, but the invasion had no justification, and it really violated all international norms. It's unfortunate that we have a UN Security Council that's paralyzed because the Russians sit on it and veto. Um, but what was the Russian plan? What did they do this for? You know, if you look at the map of, of prior to the invasion, um, you know, there's a couple of, this is what basically was Ukraine the day before the invasion. Over on the right side in the Donetsk, Luhansk area, there was some Russian control down in Crimea. Again, in 2014, the Russians had some control. So they'd already taken a couple of little tentative nibbles. Uh, ultimately, what they really wanted to do was invade from all these different axes. This is almost... 180 degrees on the map, if you look, they're coming down from the north, they're coming from the east, they're even coming in from Crimea, which is more to the southeast. So, you know, they they really thought they could whip this up in a, in a week or two. On the 24th of February, so, you know, here we are, more than 18 months out, Ukrainian forces were in shock when they were invaded by these multiple vectors of heavily armed and heavily armored Russian troops with overwhelming air power. And the Russians just rolled through town after town uh, in the first weeks. I mean, it looked like, you know, we were going to have to give Zelensky that ride out of town because uh, they were coming to Kiev. And so I'm going to play a short video about this. Um, you know, this is how the vectors kind of initially developed. And, you know, it really looked like Ukraine was, was going to fall. The government would be decapitated. The army would lay down its arms. Um, the Russians were bombing like crazy, as we know. We know they bombed schools and they bombed hospitals and they bombed shopping centers and they bombed railroad stations and they bombed power plants and electric grids. Um, the first top couple things here are not what we would consider tactical military targets. Uh, take this from a guy in uniform. We don't usually try to do this. So I'm going to have a couple of graphic slides. I'm just letting you know this is a real war. We might as well see some of the real slides. So. You know, this is the shopping center after it's been bombed, a lot of casualties, it's on fire, first responders are there. Um, this this is a street intersection with a bunch of burning vehicles and uh, numerous casualties on the street. Again, first responders are out. Uh, and uh, this is the train station and, and one of the guys at the, at the train master. So you can see they just have taken away some of the casualties, not all, but uh, it, it's pretty awful. Uh, they hit a lot of non-military targets to demoralize the Ukrainian population. Um, this also causes a tremendous humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. You may remember this. You know, more than 7 million people were displaced internally, leaving the east part of Ukraine for the western part. 6 million crossed borders to other countries. Uh, a lot of kids, and we're going to come back to the kids issue, because I gave a lecture on this at Boston College not too long ago. I was asked to talk about the children. A lot of kids have a parent involved in combat. Many have lost a parent because there's been, uh, or another close relative, there's lots of casualties. And uh, the humanitarian crisis is staggering. On February 24th, Ukrainian families woke up to their country under siege. Missile strikes and military attacks destroyed homes, schools, and businesses, putting countless lives at risk. 
In the days that followed, millions of people were forced to flee their homes in search of safety, setting off the largest refugee emergency in Europe since World War II. In the first six weeks of the conflict alone, a quarter of Ukraine's population were forced to flee their homes, finding safety in other regions of Ukraine or crossing borders into neighboring countries. 90% of those who've been forced to flee are women and children. Those who fled but remain displaced within the borders of Ukraine are known as internally displaced people or IDPs. Many were driven from their homes by heavy shelling and fighting and face the devastating impacts the war has had on their country and its infrastructure every day. Because of these dangerous and unlivable conditions, millions have been forced into neighboring European countries to find safety. In 2022, the UN Refugee Agency recorded approximately 8 million refugees from Ukraine across Europe. I can't imagine having to grab a backpack and a rolling bag and going to another country, maybe on foot. Um, but a lot of Ukrainians stood fast. The military was was terrific, but a lot more than just the military stood against the Russians. There, there's a, I, I, I like to quote the response of the garrison on Snake Island. Uh, this was 18 guys who were told by the uh, battle cruiser, the Moskva, the Russian ship Moskva, to stand down and surrender. Um, their response has been memorialized in this particular poster. I hope it does become uh, a postage stamp because uh, you all can recognize the international signal where they're responding back to the Moskva. Uh, but I found a great recording of it that uh, is translated for us. Communicating like sailors everywhere. Um, and I'll try not to do that, even though I am a former sailor. Um, what's interesting is the civilian population fought back courageously in several aspects. So here's a picture being taken at night, right after the invasion started. People are loading up bottles to make Molotov cocktails. So they're going to fight the Russians. They're not going to throw flowers on the arriving victors. They're going to throw Molotov cocktails. Um, you know, and fighting for your home is a lot different than being an evader who fights to kill and loot. If you remember the early days of the invasion, you could see a lot of the Russian uh, vehicles were being loaded up with widescreen televisions and stuff. They were looting from Ukrainian homes and they were taking it back. Um, Napoleon stated the moral is to the physical as three is to one. And you know what? It might even be a greater ratio in Ukraine because I'm very impressed. I want to highlight one teenager, a 15-year-old, who went with his drone to go locate Russian armor so that he could help target it for the Ukrainian military. 15 years old. Last summer, Andriy Pokorasa saved up enough money to buy a drone. 15-year-old practiced flying every day at his home near Kyiv. But in February, Pokorasa's town suddenly found itself on Russia's warpath. Russian tanks were spotted heading their way. Ukraine's military didn't know the exact location, so they began looking for a drone pilot. More than a thousand civilians answered the call to help, including the youngest volunteer, Pokorasa. The Russians were only a couple of kilometers away, but the military needed their exact coordinates. Pokorasa was the only experienced drone pilot in town. Before long, he spotted an armored column of Russian vehicles. His father sent the images and coordinates to the military, and the Russian column was destroyed. Pokorasa's town was saved. <laughs> Я не хотів, щоб з моїм домом було те ж саме, що з домами людей у окупованих територіях. This kid is credited with over 100 armored vehicles um, he targeted and Ukrainians were able to take out. Uh, and he said something very important. This is my home. Uh, and I think that's crucial. But the problem is we have this tremendous family disruption uh, because of all this. We talked about not only the refugees, but we lost the homes and businesses are destroyed. You saw the shopping center. There's lots of casualties, civilian and military, lots of displaced. And, and when you travel around, so I've had the opportunity now to be in Ukraine three different times during the war for several weeks each time. Uh, it's, it's doing overtime, uh, lots of casualties, lots, lots of activity at the, at the cemeteries, unfortunately. 
Uh, the other thing you see that's just kind of heartbreaking is here's somebody who's probably more or less my age peer. He's probably retired um, and nuts his house. And here he is out with his shovel. He's going to rebuild his life uh, when he should be relaxing with his feet up, reading a book and smoking his pipe, right? So um, I, I just can't imagine having my house destroyed and having to rebuild it. So again, the children, I want to come back to this because there's some interesting aspects when I do research. There's thousands of Ukrainians, kids are affected. Some have physical wounds. You're going to see some of those. Again, it's a graphic discussion. There's lots of psychological wounds we'll talk about. Um, and they're going to have PTSD that's going to cross generations. It's going to be, this is going to last a long time. They're going to need a lot of help. Um, some of the examples, you know, we talked about the housing, the damaged schools, the damaged hospitals, kids get injured. Um, you know, if this is your classroom, how long is it going to take to be able to put this back in action so you could go to school? Uh, I guess it's going to be a long time. And if this is your gym, how long is it going to be before you can go there and shoot baskets? You know, it just breaks my heart to see that these are not military targets, but the Russians target them. And if you're this kid, um, minus three limbs and uh, heavily scarred, you know, what's what's your future going to be like? Um, you know, yes, you can call him a hero and brave but he's going to have a tough time. Um, children are really badly affected psychologically. They develop phobias. They develop fears. They get psychosomatic symptoms. You know, they can't sleep. They get stomach aches. You know, y'all had kids. You know what I'm talking about. And they do something interesting. Sometimes they mimic adult behavior. And, and when I see this picture, I, I cringe a little bit because these kids are obviously growing up to defend their country at a very early age. I'm not sure if these weapons are real or fake. I think they're real. And uh, they're ready to go out there and fight for their homes. And, and what are they, 11, 12 years old? I don't know. Um, you know, it just kind of breaks my heart. They should be shooting baskets and, you know, flying drones and doing TikTok. But, you know, what, instead they get to go to the park where there's a little demonstration to explain uh, if you see these bombs or bomblets or grenades or things or things that look like they might have a wire, like you can see the basketball has a little booby trap wire, don't pick them up because they're dangerous. So uh, the only equivalent I can think of in our country, which is very sad, is um, that our kids have to do active shooter drills, which, you know, but this is this has got to be, you know, light years worse than that uh, for these kids to have to think about it. So what's Putin achieved, you know, by wanting to be, you know, the resurrection of Peter the Great? Well, he's damaged uh, over 3,000 schools, destroyed over 300. Uh, over 130,000 Ukrainian buildings have been destroyed by the bombs and the rockets. Uh, a lot of hospitals heavily damaged, 128 were completely destroyed. How many Russian casualties? I've heard from the Institute of the Study of War, maybe 300,000 so far. Very hard to get real numbers. And we don't know from the Ukrainian side either. Uh, but we do know is when you saw this picture of the maternity hospital getting bombed and the pregnant mother being evacuated, uh, she and her baby later died. Again, hospitals are not military targets. They have no tactical or strategic value. And, and the same was true with schools. And this apartment building just randomly taken out. Uh, I'm going to show it to you because uh, ultimately there are a large number of casualties. But if you look um, at this pseudo military target. Uh, that morning, there was apparently a birthday party in, in the flat with the yellow uh, cabinets. And uh, this is just before the missile strike. I had the birthday party, mom and the kids go off to the park. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, what happens is that whole apartment building segment gets blown up. There's that yellow kitchen with the cabinets you can see. And um, unfortunately, you know, dad was in the apartment. Dad got killed in the strike. So now you have a family that's no father, displaced from their home. And uh, I don't even know if you can go back in the building to get stuff. So it's it's crazy. The part of the good news is despite all the devastation and the overwhelming Russian force, the battlefield tide did turn. And when we saw this original, this is from March 13th, you can look at the map, all those vectors I showed you on that map with Russian forces rolling in from Kiev to Kherniv to Kharkiv to from into Mariupol and Melitopol, all these areas, Kherson, um, you know, eventually the tide starts to turn and the Ukrainians are fighting back. And by September 2022, 
they've really got their game on and they're pushing to the north. They push the Russians away from Kiev. They retook the Kharkiv region uh, and they have pushed away from Kherson and other places, uh, done a magnificent job in stopping the Russian invasion. They took the fight to the east, to the south, um, you know, and these kinds of vectors that we see that are still ongoing every day. Uh, ground changes literally by yards uh, as opposed to miles now, because this is a much different war. Now that they got rid of the invasion part of the Russian forces, now they have to deal with something different. They have to deal with this area where the Russians have had decade to prepare. They've had 10 years. Um, and if you do a satellite image, again, this is from the uh, Institute for the Study of War, you can see three lines across this image in one area. What the Russians do is set up a defense line with an anti-tank ditch here at the top of the screen. Then these devil's teeth, which are concrete obstacles to stop armored vehicles. And then the primary defensive trench uh, down below here, we're zigzagging, uh, in which I'll show you a little closer up view. This is a close up view. You can see this defensive trench going all the way around the town, including communication trenches back to what I assume is headquarters. Um, but in front of this is the dragon's teeth and then the big ditch. So it's all tough stuff to deal with. Since the start of the invasion, Russia has been digging along the 900 mile front line and even on its own territory. The first layer of defense shown in many satellite images is the anti-tank ditch. The obstacle is meant to be too wide for a tank to cross, restricting an enemy's ability to maneuver and funnel their forces into areas that make them more vulnerable to attack. That's mining equipment. Next are rows of concrete blocks called Dragon's Teeth. They form a barrier that makes it difficult for heavy vehicles to pass through. And the third line is a trench. This is the most common type of defensive work and the easiest to construct. Russian forces dug many trenches along roads, junctions and bridges, and even on the beaches of Crimea and Ukrainian forces are likely to face further traps. I believe landmines have also been hidden between defensive lines. So this is gonna be a tough fight. Anybody who expected this to go as fast as the retaking of Kherson and those other places, not gonna happen because these guys are really dug in. Uh, and they've had, it's gonna be a very slow and difficult fight. Gotta remember Russia has four times the population of Ukraine. They have air superiority that have a huge uh, industrial capacity, uh, and the Russian back Black Sea Fleet's been blocking Ukrainian exports. Ukraine can get an occasional grain ship out, but nothing like it was doing before when they were face, you know, actually feeding 12% of the world population. So Ukraine has to put together this major offensive operation. We call uh, these kinds of activities combined arms operations. They've been training on this. Uh, it's very difficult to do urban city ops and river crossings, which they're now doing uh, across the Dnieper, which is, is tough. It's complex. It's resource management intensive. Uh, it requires tremendously good synchronization and logistics. To do a river crossing is probably about the hardest thing there is. Uh, and they need air cover. So I, I can't emphasize this enough. It's something I've been beating the drum with, with our uh, legislators you know, air power allows Ukraine to push Russian aircraft back. The Russians come right up to the border and launch glide bombs and rockets into the Ukrainian uh, lines. But, you know, if they can't push the air power back, the civilian lives and infrastructure are going to remain at risk, uh, much worse over the winter when they start sending more missiles into the electric grid. Uh, without air power, it's really hard to do that river crossing, that ground offensive. So, you know, it's going to cost a lot more lives to do this. Uh, and it might be impossible without air power. So, you know, we need to give the Ukrainian forces, this is something I, I really emphasize when I am out speaking to other groups or talking to legislators, give them everything they need and they'll take care of this problem. We've got to ignore the Russian blackmail, the threats of nuclear war. We know that that's off the table. Um, we have, they got the long range attack guns, which is a good thing. Uh, they got actually medium range ones, they used them very effectively and, and, and took out two squadrons of Ukrainian helicopters, excuse me, Russian helicopters. They got to use those cruise missiles and storm shadows and scalps. We got to give them a lot more of that stuff. And we just delivered 31 Abrams tanks uh, along with other armored vehicles. 31 tanks is not enough. These should have been there six months ago. We should have started this sooner. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a drip, 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 but we're getting there. Uh, we're going the right direction. 
but more, all, you know, they really need F-16s and helicopters. The F-16, um, you know, all this stuff's been delayed by the Russian nuclear threats. Um, but you can't do this stuff without air power. Ukraine needs, you know, F-16s. One of the problems is that the pilots require English proficiency to be able to fly our planes. So up at this moment, Ukraine has sent eight English proficient pilots for training immediately, getting trained right now, probably to be uh, ready to fly in the fight by the first of the year. That's not really enough. Um, I want to take you back in history. Some of you may remember this lesson of history. They're called the Flying Tigers. So during World War II, uh, American government and military sponsored a Flying Tigers group uh, to flow against the Japanese uh, in the area around China and Burma. They flew for Chiang Kai-shek. A lot of them were former U.S. military pilots. Let's take it to this time, 2023. Lockheed has produced over 3,000 F-16s. Uh, there are thousands of trained pilots in numerous countries. I believe the number flying these is 27 countries, most of which are now fading them out uh, and phasing them out and, and ready to switch uh, to the next airframe, which is the F-35. There's a lot of pilots who know how to fly F-16. So my thought is, probably if you put out the call, a lot of these guys would go fight for democracy and be kind of modern flying tigers. If not for democracy, possibly for money. You know, the Ukrainians paid a Russian pilot $500,000 for his helicopter. Uh, I bet they could get a lot of pilots for that. Uh, I'd like to see them stand up an international volunteer squadron, uh, just, just like we had in the Flying Tigers in World War II. Uh, I've been putting that editorial thought out uh, to a lot of recipients. We'll see if somebody, uh, I'm surprised we haven't done it yet, because, you know, there is an international uh, legion in Ukraine fighting on the ground. But this is the tool they need. This is modern. I'd love to show you some of the demonstrations of how good it is. Uh, it would create a balance of power in Ukraine-Russia conflict that would be very helpful to the Ukrainians. It's a very, very good platform. So I'm going to stop my screen share and turn things over to Anastasia, who's going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in Russia. Thank you, Michael, for this wonderful, um, very sombering um, analysis of what is going on. And uh, you know, I wanted to use this a, a chance to say hi to people who have taken my classes and um, I haven't seen you in a year. So um, here's my chance before I start sharing the screen to say hello to all of you and hope you're doing well. So uh, what I wanna do is um, talk about what is going on in um, Russia, uh, the sort of aggressor in this war um, that um, started at its, really hard to fathom, at least for me, uh, that this war, not only, you know, like this impossible war is actually um, not only happened, but it has been going on for now 611 days. Uh, and uh, it, the fighting is not sort of tapering off. It's, it's a very strange situation in the world, I feel, when uh, there is a major war in Europe, uh, and you've seen the slides, and um, slides can't convey really what's going on in Ukraine. Um, in my town where I live, uh, we have a few refugees uh, who have escaped uh, Ukraine, and they are women and children, and uh, you know, it's very sad to see, and th these are the lucky people who made it to America, were allowed to stay here and kind of now, you know, have to look for housing, have to um, ask people to literally let them in and leave because they, you know, can't afford Bay Area. And so, and then talking to their children and how they have been affected by the war, in fact, they photograph that Michael shared of uh, one of the moles that was bombed. I, I, I know exactly uh, what it was. And I know a person who uh, was there at the time of the bombing. And, you know, she's a 16 year old girl. And, um, you know, that's where she told me that's when she realized this is really real and they, they've got to get out. Um, and so it's a tough um, 
really tough scenario. But yet, you know, around Ukraine, Poland, um, Italy, I mean, Europe is a small place. If you go there, you wouldn't you wouldn't even know that there is this major war um raging. So this is why, you know, I'm calling it a very strange war. Like the fighting is pretty intense, but um uh, it's it's kind of like it's in the news cycle and it goes on and off, but um, war doesn't know news cycle. It's been as intense and as tragic, in fact, more tragic because, you know, as in any war, the people who really wanted to fight and who were capable of fighting, you know, they go first and they are drafted first, they're professionals, but then um, the war, which this war, and we can talk about it later, uh, Michael has is probably better positioned than me to talk, but um, I believe that this is at this point, definitely a war of attrition. And what the war of attrition means is that, you know, people you know, like you, people you know are getting killed people you went to school with um, come home without legs. And, um, you know, yes, we think of Ukrainians as heroes, which they are, but the daily reality of, um, you know, being drafted and thrown straight into the front line with a relentless enemy who doesn't care, they don't value their own lives, you know, and this is sort of my segue into Russia, but it's, um, um, even though I guess I'm trying to emphasize the point even though the news cycle has turned and you know right now all we hear is middle east um for a for a reason but this thing doesn't stop uh it continues and it's um demands our attention so thank you for being here and um for signing up for this update because it's um it's an important one and unfortunately in this new reality in which we live we all have to multitask we have to follow multiple calamities that are going around the world and try to do something about them. Okay, so um, let's talk the aggressor, let's talk Russia. Uh, I wanna, so we talked last time, I believe a year ago um, in November. So I wanted to kind of give you the overall picture of what has changed um, in this last year and what are the key developments so again um most people who are anti-war russians like me who are following the war kind of count by the days and so i know that today is day 611 of that um a war of choice that vladimir putin uh, started uh, Russia had suffered uh, between 189 to 223,000 in casualties, uh, with up to 43,000 killed. Now, that's the data that was leaked uh, here in the U.S. Um, as you probably know, Russia doesn't disclose its casu casualties, uh, but there are indirect evidence. There is evidence, right, because Russian cemeteries have entire new sections for the people that are being killed. Um, there is a lot of, uh, for instance, recently Russian health ministry ordered another half million blanks, uh, blanks or like, I guess, um, receipts uh, for pain compensation to those murdered or wounded in Ukraine. So which gives you indirect evidence to what, we get through Western uh, um, Western intelligence services. So it is a very noticeable war in Russia. It's not as it is in Ukraine, but it's uh, because they're not being bombed. They're not, uh, but but it's it's there. People see it. Uh, but what do they do about it is another question. I mean, plenty of you probably. Uh, you know, hoped uh, that this war will be that final um, sort of uh, last redoubt after which the Russians are going to rise up and sweep away this government that not only, you know, the sort of uh, robs them and, and puts them in gulag of modernity, but also uh, that now makes murder in their name, a mass murder of a fraternal nation. And so I was one of those people uh, waiting for it to happen. 
but it's not happening, right? So what's happening instead is Michael and I didn't align our slides that much, but we're using the same word. They're digging in. Russia is digging in literally and metaphorically. So you've seen the literal part, you know, this whole dragon teeth, uh, the, the three lines of uh, trenches and defenses. And uh, that, by the way, were built. Um, Michael said that, you know, it took them 10 years to dig in there. And it probably is so because he knows the military side of things. But it also took all those months when U.S. could have been and the West could have been supplying the weapons um, to capitalize on the success of the Kherson operation. Uh, if only we've given Ukraine what it has been asked, uh, asking us to do, uh, they wouldn't have had the time to build this incredible lines. I mean, Ukraine is now the most mined country in the world. Uh, so many landmines everywhere, mines in the beaches of the Black Sea on which I grew up, um, you know, and used to swim. That's kind of what hits home uh, with me, is that you can't swim in Odessa anymore. You can't swim anywhere because of the uh, all of the mines. So uh, we did allow uh, Russia the time they wanted and they needed um, to dig in for many reasons, you know, one of them is the nuclear um, blackmail that Russia is so good at doing. Just recently, those of you who did um, watch the news probably saw this sort of flashy update about Russia testing, doing the nuclear, a massive nuclear preparedness drill. So again, um, they're doing what they can to keep those weapons um, in the drip fashion because they know that in the long run uh, they're playing the long game you know we're not playing the long game united states is um in this conflict has shown i feel shown itself very sh um short term i, I mean they and, and for a reason right we have an elected government that changes every four years and the congress at every two years so uh, there are, the cycle is longer. I'm, I'm not saying it as a uh, something of a, kind of like a, that that it's wrong. It's wrong. I'm just saying that unlike Putin, who has all the time in the world, who can afford waiting uh, by throwing cannon meat <laughs> to the front lines, uh, we we uh, as a West don't operate on the same time scale. Um, so the net uh, the net result of it is that we've allowed the Russians to dig in, and it's going to be much harder uh, for them um, to be taken uh, out now. Um, so in Russia itself, um, now uh, switching more towards the uh, non military or or rather non physical side of things. So uh, I remember having conversations when I was writing one of my pieces for foreign policy about the future of Russia with some high-ranking former uh, military officials here in, in the United States and in Europe, who basically, to my question, are you worried about Russia switching to this sort of um, military mode? Mili I mean, it's always been militarized, but really switching towards the war, it's production capacity. Are you worried? Because, uh, yes, Russia is not as advanced in certain weaponry as uh, the West, uh, just collectively, you know, NATO and, and America, but they have enough capacity to just keep uh, producing these shells that are pummeling Ukrainian cities, they uh, they can they have a lot of stockpiles from World War II, and we see them in action in Ukraine. I mean, people. There are a lot of memes on kind of Russian-speaking uh, media about uh, old tanks being put to use. But these are, yeah. I mean, it's funny, but it's on, until you know this. Uh, piece of uh, rusty iron, as they say, uh, lands in front of your home and, uh, you know, destroys it because they do blow up 
and they do work. So Russia has existentially switched to this all for the front, all for the victory mode, which I remember growing up from the Soviet era war movies. You know, that's kind of the motto that they pulled out from essentially the past, from fiction that Putin has watched the same movies with me, dusted it off and put it up because, you know, in this year, what happened is they have completely hijacked uh, the informational space, shutting down what little alternative narratives there remained. And, and basically in the switch, what they've done is they have repositioned this war from war of aggression, which I mean, most people understood what happened uh, on February 24th, uh, 2022. But that narrative has changed because any expert on propaganda can tell you that if you say the same story over and over again loudly and you shut down all alternative stories, human mind works like that. Um, you either have to go mad, right? Uh, and you have to get it out on the street and protest and be imprisoned, killed, poisoned, what the Russian stay put, or you have to go into a survival mode. And partially the survival mode is to tell yourself that maybe, maybe they are right. Maybe we Russia is fighting for its survival against the West, against NATO. Maybe I haven't noticed it, but maybe Ukraine actually did attack Russia. So those people who war in this sort of in-between zone. Uh, what what we have seen in this year is that people had to make a choice, and we haven't seen mass protests in Russia, so you know what the what choice they made. Uh, the um, the other thing that uh, which I feel like this year has changed drastically in our understanding of Putin's power. Um, well, maybe not changed. Uh, some of us did understand it, but at least in the perception of Putin's power in the West, there was a lot of talk uh, about uh, sort of the possible fracture in Putin's vertical of power, um, or, you know, you can call it elite. It's hard to call people who are criminals uh, elite, but uh, the people in power in Russia, the, the hope was that the so-called Russian elites will start fracturing and the um, sanctions and, and sort of Russia's complete isolation from the world would force Putin to change course. And uh, that would, uh, you know, that was the hope with a lot of people in the West, not as much in, in um, sort of the people who like me understand the essence of the Russian state. So uh, it was a very interesting exercise that we have um, all watched in June with uh, this coup by Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, so I wanna talk about that, but before I switch uh, uh, to my first bullet, just to um, stress the degree of switching of Russia towards the, uh, military production, I wanted to play you a clip from a Russian TV. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a translation, uh, but uh, what you need to know, it's kind of self-explanatory. It's in my illustration to this all for the front, all for the victory. It played on the Russian channel one, I believe, or Russia one, and it um, uh, arguably described how um, Describe how a, a, a retired uh, person from a, a Russian city asked uh, a bread production plant to be switched to military production plant. And this is what they ran on Russian TV, um, I believe, um, last week. So uh, let's see that. Просьбу кавалера четырех орденов мужества услышали, и к производству дронов немедленно приступил Тамбовский хлебокомбинат. 
Еще в советские времена практически все заводы имели двойное назначение. Вчера делали макароны, а сегодня уже патроны. Вот так и здесь. Хотите батоны, а хотите дрон. So, uh, okay, um, going back from, oops, sorry, I don't know what happened, but I unshared my screen for a second. So, well, I think I um, accidentally closed the presentation or it crashed. It always happens when you have this um, YouTube uh, videos. So give me uh, just a second uh, when it will restart. Sorry about that. It's just taking its time. So um, while my PowerPoint restart, and if it doesn't restart, I guess I'll ask Michael to share the presentation, but it's um, kind of trying to, to do it right now. Give me a moment. Mm. Right. Mm. Sorry, guys, almost there. Okay. So I assume you can see my screen. Uh, yeah, you have to go up and, and click on use slideshow. Sorry, where? Like what happened previously that now we see oh. your presenter view. Or do that. Okay, let's see. Oh, I'm in present to you, right? Uh, okay, I think this should do it. Okay. All right, so um, the the uh, the video that <laughs> crashed the system was basically a repurposing of a bread plant towards production of drones, and this is happening all over Russia. Um, this is now has become the official agenda. This is where the country is going, and they're not going to turn uh, back. Another thing is that they are preparing for the so-called no alternative presidential elections in 2024. When I say um, so-called is they call it no alternative presidential elections. So Putin's spokesperson recently said that there is no alternative to Vladimir Putin, but they're going to do it anyway because uh, democracy protocol requires it. Like that's the way that they talk about it on the official le level these days. And um, another important thing that happened uh, in 2023 was the ge geopolitical pivot uh, that Russia has um, done towards, um, they call it a two pivot, a pivot east towards China. And um, they're a very strong alliance that is emerging between Russia and China. China still has not condemned um, Russia's aggression. And neither has India and uh, plenty of other countries in in um, Africa and Latin America. So uh, what is happening is that Putin is trying to position Russia as this new 
sort of crusader against American hegemony and the power of the West. I mean, it's nothing new. Uh, this has been Russia's Soviet mode, and this has been the mode um, for quite some time, but it's more pronounced now, and it will be even more pronounced. Okay. Crashed. Okay, luckily we skipped this time. So I want to talk about economic developments and how is play how is this playing out for the Russian economy? So um Russian economy is hurting, uh, but it's not collapsing. And that is uh, also a correction from uh literally a year ago I was talking to the top experts, including the economic experts who uh, basically expected Russia to crash, to collapse uh, because of the uh, unprecedented, you know, I hate this word now, and everything is unprecedented. The unprecedented sanctions actually turned out to be not so unprecedented uh, because, you know, as somebody who grew up in USSR, I've seen this sanction. I mean, USSR was economically isolated from the West. So uh, the difference with USSR now is that there are plenty of uh, money talks, right? The Soviet Union was ideologically opposed to capitalism, which uh, would make it very bad for somebody like, you know, Brezhnev or Khrushchev to buy stuff in the West. Now, uh, Russia positions itself as a capitalist country. So they strike deals with um, a lot of people who are willing to supply uh, Russia with what it needs. Um, production of weaponry has been scaled up and the component supply holes plugged um, uh, via various places, uh, particularly Iran and China, but uh, not only. Um, just recently, the, uh, there was a study or, or investigation released by the insider uh, uh, Russian opposition media uh, which talked about this um, this ballistic, uh, the, the much talk about ballistic uh, missile named Kinjal, which in Russian means dagger. Uh, the production of that ballistic missile that's hurting Ukraine a lot is uh, actually supplied by, you know, components come from the EU, from Poland, from Germany, uh, and a whole bunch of uh, American parts is coming from the Arab countries uh, through middleman companies that are just buying them in the U.S. and selling them um, to Russia. So, that, so I just talked about that. Um, now, for the first time after the fall of the USSR, Russia's new military spend will exceed um, the economic spend. Uh, so now uh, it amounts to the 30% of Russia's overall budget. That's a big number, right? Uh, so uh, those of you who, when you hear that, you know, American military is the strongest military in the world, that is true. Uh, but uh, this, Country, this big country basically decided to dig in and win this war. And what it means is that switching everything to military rails, whether they will succeed or not, I guess we will leave to find out. Uh, but this, this is definitely not something that, you know, when I was bringing it up last year, I wouldn't say I was laughed off, but people said Russia can't find against the entire world. Well, two corrections. Well, it turns out it, Russia has a lot of resources, uh, manpower and military heavy industry, because that's still from the Soviet times. It's very weak on consumer and it's, it continues to export consumer stuff. But its heavy industry has been built to uh, withstand uh, all sorts of crises. And we see that happening. So. Yes, can Russia win against the entire world? Probably not, but let's look at the entire world. Is Russia against the entire world? Not really. I mean, there are plenty of enablers of Russian aggression and they are uh, themselves a problem for the United. I mean, why is India's, I hope, um, yes, Russian uh, oil is not being bought by the West anymore. That one thing did happen, but it's it's been sold to India. 
yes, they're losing money, but it's not in the situation where they're crashing, right? They, they, they're hurting, but they're functioning. And um, yes, this is all, you know, two years might sound like a long time, but it's really not um, that long, you know, in the, in the historical perspective. So yes, eventually this uh, measures and isolation of Russia might make it hurt more, uh, but it's kind of designed to be self-sustained. Uh, so if we're just waiting for Russia to collapse, it's not going to collapse on its on its own. It's um, it, we have uh, this war needs to be won for Russia to stop being a menace. Uh, there is no other way. It wouldn't go away on its own, so to say. Um, so another disturbing development is uh, Russian GDP has been universally um, um predicted to collapse uh it didn't it didn't really fall in fact it did grow a tiny percentage um 0.3 percent i believe that's not a lot of growth but uh it's boosted by military orders right that it, uh, there is a lot of government spending that's happening on military production and on uh, this whole switch to mili military to the war and then there is this really disturbing thing that um, tells us a lot about, um, you know, Russian society, the so-called coffin money. Um, this is how Russians refer to the one-time payments that the Putin regime gives to the families of the murdered uh, soldiers. Now, that coffin money, um, it is not an insignificant amount I believe last time I checked, we're talking about $75,000. Now in a country where an average salary hovers around $400, that is a lot a month, $400 a month. That is that is a money, right? And so what uh, we have seen is that in the depressed area of Russia from where the majority of the records come from, this money allows them to their families to buy an apartment. They can buy cars. I mean, Russian TV is a uh, a wash with this stories of families of murdered soldiers, um, their families going off and buying um, and buying ladas and buying apartments. So uh, it's despicable and shows you the level of the dehumanization of the society where war is actually a way to upward mobility. If you don't get murdered, um, you know, you get, and if you're just wounded, you get paid. You get paid for fighting in Ukraine. They paid, again, um, the starting salary of Russian recruits there who go to fight in Ukraine is $2,500. Average salary, 400. And that's if you're lucky. So um, Putin made it profit, uh, made it um, attractive to kill, and that's that's you know has consequences. So a lot of times I'm asked if the sanctions are working, uh, and um, the que the thing is yes they are working. The oil price kept negatively impacted Russia's budget. You can see, uh, you don't need to strain your eyes, but this is Russia's month federal government balance is a big draw <laughs> and um you know it will continue dropping um but um so so that's one thing russian oil is not financing russia's um war to the extent that it used to uh, we have uh travel to eu is complicated now for the russians because the airspace is closed and uh but travel is happening. It's just that instead of flying to London in two hours, they now go through Azerbaijan or countries that accept Russian planes and then they go. So it's complicated, but it's manageable for the people who travel abroad, a uh, Russian quote unquote elite. Um, it's complicated, but it's still happening. Um, consumer demand is down. Uh, for durables and stuff and high-tech industries are affected so all of this is saying yes the sanctions are working <laughs> the question is 
do the Russians really care? Like, is that enough? And my answer to you is no. Like they, this is the generation still, they're half of Russia's current generation grew up in the USSR like I did, right? Or were born in the USSR. They remember those days, um, how they are, they had nothing. Now they have more than nothing and uh, they will survive. They will learn to survive with a little. And uh, so the expectation of um, there being some kind of uprising against Putin or at least some kind of pressure in the more, more moderate faction around Putin uh, will change it. It's just not realistic. And uh, this guy proves it, right? I mean, this seems like a, a long story from a long time ago, but I'm just reminding you that only in June, um, this man known as Pre uh, Putin's cook, Yevgeny Prigozhin, Prigozhin the infamous uh, uh, owner of Wagner, Wagner paramilitary, undertook his march on Moscow. And I just wanted to show you how close he got. Like, look at this map. He started out from Rostov, the city where my family is from, my other side of the family. It's a southern, big Russian southern city uh, on the um, near Az Azov Sea. So I actually recognized some of the streets when they were the tanks were rolling through the Rostov. And so they they marched and they entered Rostov. Then they there was no resistance and they went all the way to Moscow. And you know. I was contacted by a lot of news agency asking for comments and, and people were given comments and predicting how this will affect, you know, Putin's vertical of power and how, you know, Russian regime is un unstable and whatnot. So, so how did the things pan out? We see the picture on the right of Prigozhin's crashed plane. So um, unfortunately this, coup, this aborted, self-aborted coup, uh, tells us two things. One, uh, very few people actually understand Russia and understand what's going on, because the amount of commentary that was happening in June about the change of regime and what's, it's like, it was just mind-blowing, right? And nothing happened. Prigozhin was killed, um, just shot down in plain sight uh, by a missile, and uh, this is your answer to the split in the Russian elites. There is no split. Uh, the person uh, in the Kremlin rules and um, those who forget it, even if they are very close to him, uh, will be taken out. What was more surprising to me, um, and it shows us the sad place the Russian society is in, is the reaction of the Russian people. I mean, we're talking about Wagner people, those are the people who settle their disagreements with others with a sledgehammer. Those are the people who are responsible for multiple war crimes, not just in Ukraine, but all over the world where the Wagner paramilitary participated. Uh, they are scary criminal people. They were welcomed in Rostov. They were hugged. They were given water. And yes, some people are saying, well, that's because he was going against Putin and that's they were trying to show their support because yes, Prigozhin and his crazy sort of PR stink leading up and during the invasion did talk the, the talk of the, um, you know, this was a march for justice. They wanted justice for the military, for the Russian soldiers who were, not properly supplied and he's going to take matters in his own hand and whatnot. I don't think that's what the Russian people were worshipping uh, when um, they they were um, meeting the Wagner troops. Uh, I think those poisonous seeds that the Putin regime has sowed, this worship of violence and worship of strength, which by the way is the same thing, worship of some victory, this is what happens. People are basically embracing uh, whoever is the strongest guy on the block. And that's what uh, was, that's what I think uh, 
um, we witnessed, and that should uh, really, you know, show us that the Russians that we are dealing in with now are not the Russians of your youth, of the Cold War. These are very different people, um, sort of, um, bro um, whose mind has been altered, uh, and and we should uh, plan accordingly. And you know. Of course, propaganda is partly to blame for that. I mean, uh, it has always been pretty bad in Russia, but uh, it has become incredibly uh, cranked up. These are the pictures from high school. Now, ra all Russian secondary schools now have mandatory conversations about important things where people like this who have been to the war, who have murdered Ukrainians, come to Russian schools and tell them, um, you know, how they were there protecting their country against NATO aggression. It has really rewritten its textbooks. These are the new Russian textbooks released for the uh, new year, where uh, the, the, the page that I'm showing you, those of you who still remember, you really can try and read it, but basically it's called uh, the special military operation and the Russian society uh, where it just gives you this completely warped view of the world about how you know, Russia basically responded to a NATO stage Ukrainian attack and went into Ukraine to defend its own territory. This is scaled, right? This is taught in every Russian school because it's not like here you know every school has their own curricula their own textbooks this is one textbook for it says 11th grade um, which now is going to be taught throughout Russia and so propaganda is really really incredible they're re re literally rewriting history and um and succeed in it, in convincing people that their cause is right. Uh, the Russians are encouraged to die with weapons in the hands. There are plenty of uh, Russian Orthodox Church is actually playing a very, very unsavory role in this invasion and um, you know, saying that those who die in Ukraine, their sins will be forgiven. Um, they tell them that this is a virtuous thing to die with weapon in their arms. I mean, this is all heavy stuff. And, you know, sometimes I just think even when this, if and when this war is won, what are we going to do with all these people? It's like, because it's not like you can hit and do, right? And it's like, oh, okay, going back. This, this is really altering uh, the minds of uh, people uh, in a big, big country. I mean, there are 145 million people that are being brainwashed into really scary stuff like this. I mean, this is a picture, by the way, those, and um, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll actually start winding down because I want us to have some sort of um, kind of closure and answer some of your questions. But, uh, the person you see on the left is the infamous uh, Kremlin ideologue, Alexander Dugin, who is present in uh, this um, conference uh, in Iran. Uh, and it, it just shows you that uh, Russia is aligning along this bizarre narrative, you know, obscurantism narrative of crusade against the satanic west right there was a like i said there's a strong religious component and they're bringing in the countries like iran uh into this orbit uh and yes uh the west is stronger than whatever the orbit they're building military wise but this is how they are explaining to their own population why there are no more, you know, why the Western goods have gone up in price or they need to be smuggled. They're basically repositioning this as the battle with uh, with the West. And of course, the usual stuff, you know, now not only Navalny is in prison, but his lawyers are in prison. And, uh, you know, the, the, the priest who was known to be anti-war had fled the country. So 
I think overall, uh, what I want to, I guess, finish with, um, and then I'll play you an illustration, hopefully it wouldn't crash, and then I'll pass it back over to Michael, is that what we've seen is the consolidation of the Russian society around Putin. 70% of Russians support special military operation despite massive casualties. Now, yes, um, multiple times we're told that um, surveys do not tell you the whole picture and what in a totalitarian country. It is true, but it doesn't matter. If you are saying yes because you're scared or and you think no, it, what it means is that the Russian society completely incapable of eliciting change from within this they 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 rallied around their leader it's a typical it's pretty typical in wartime and um so your choice is like i started this talk either you go protest or you submit and the russian society has accepted the war uh with all related they will be doing what they're told they will be cranking drones instead of breath batons and um that's the way it's going to go. And I'm just going to try and play this uh, video to show you that, you know, this is actually different. This is different from USSR, where propaganda was ubiquitous. And um, I grew up with it. I know it. But I've not ever seen the zeal uh, uh, towards this propaganda with which, which I see now. And that's sort of uh, disturbing. So this is um, uh, gonna be a video from a concert recorded by their one of their most popular singers now who gathers stadiums, um, you know, like giant concert halls and sings this patriotic, patriotic songs uh, about Russia. So I'm gonna play just a little bit so that you understand um, what I'm talking about. So hopefully it works. Я вдыхаю этот воздух, солнце в небе смотрит на меня, над мной летает волен ветер. Такой же, как и я И хочется просто любить и дышать И мне другого не нужно Такой, какой есть, и меня не сломать И все потому, что я русский Я иду до конца Я All right, enough of that. So, um, sorry, I'm gonna uh, at this point actually gonna stop sharing and um, turn it back to Michael. Um, I think we want to talk a little bit uh, about the future and handle um, your questions. Michael, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. There we go. So let's talk about some aspects of the conflict because there's so much to talk about. Uh, and we're going to try and get to your questions. If we don't get to them, you know, you're always welcome to email me at some point. Um, but, you know, as Anastasia said, and this is really important, Russia's sort of doing okay with all this, and they have this coalition uh, getting weaponry from North Korea, from Iran, probably from China, uh, even some obscure Chinese help, like having a Chinese cargo ship 
uh, damage the pipeline between Estonia and Finland. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on. A lot of countries are supportive of Russia, uh, even though they've all these countries, you know, are helping Russia launch an open assault on democracy. The United Nations is silent. Um, there's something else going on. Uh, they've utilized Hamas. So I know this is not what the news experts are saying, but you know, some of my strategic thinking friends and I talk about this. If you, by using Hamas to cause trouble, uh, what the, Russia has accomplished with that particular event, which is sponsored by Iran, uh, Russians' fingerprints aren't clearly on it, but in my mind, they're clearly on it because they've divided us. All of a sudden, we're not giving 100% aid, uh, both you know, material and intelligence to Ukraine, because we're giving a whole lot of it to Israel. They've divided the U.S. and NATO uh, over the Israel issue. Uh, they've taken the Ukraine war off the media. There's hardly anything on the news at night. Um, I mean, this is really a brilliant strategic move is to get their proxies to go cause another conflict. Uh, the other thing they did was they managed to sink the Israel-Saudi Arabia rapprochement. You know, they almost had a treaty. They're, they're literally this close to opening up their countries to each other, which would, of course, further isolate Iran. They don't want to see that happen. So if you look at the thing that's going on today in Israel with Hamas, with Hezbollah, which are all Iranian proxies, the Russians are in on it. Uh, they're helping. So let's talk a little Can bit I about the future. Just for a second, Michael. Please. Um, I don't know if you know, but um, who is hosting currently, officially, a Hamas delegation? Hamas delegation has been in Moscow since, I believe, yesterday uh, in the Kremlin talking to Vladimir Putin. So uh, people who think that this is not connected uh, sh should really think twice. It, it, it's all connected and, it, and it's a brilliant strategic maneuver. Um, so what do I think is going to happen? Well, I think the Ukrainian military will persevere. They'll make some gains. It's going to be tough because, as Anastasia pointed out earlier, you know, the originally trained up, ready to go guys, a lot of them have become casualties. And now we're depending a little bit more on conscription. Uh, I don't think this is a good time to negotiate. I don't think giving the Russians anything is ever a good idea. Uh, the Russians, if they start to lose more ground, they might start to want to bargain. Uh, but I personally think they've got to give back all the occupied lands, whether it's Donetsk, Luhansk, Crimea. They violated international law and nobody stood up to them. And in the history of autocracies and dictators, uh, as well demonstrated in 1938, if you give them Czechoslovakia, uh, pretty soon they're going to want something else. So if Putin doesn't get a really bad defeat here, he's going to just rearm and come back and take something else. So we, we got to think about how we're going to get the Russians out of these areas. Uh, it's going to be tough. What's the future? Um, I'm optimistic that Ukraine will survive and will thrive. Um, this crisis, when I travel around Ukraine, there's a very solid national identity. Even many Russian-speaking Ukrainians identify as Ukrainians. They are not Russians. They don't want to be part of Russia. Uh, as I showed you earlier, it mobilized people in new ways to defend their country. Um, and they're actually working on their democracy, getting stronger. They're doing a fair amount of anti-corruption activity, something we probably need to do with certain members of our Senate, Congress, and maybe even Supreme Court. Uh, and their market economy has been growing. You know, there's a lot of talent in Ukraine. I'm always very impressed by uh, the talent, the, uh, you know, entrepreneurial uh, bent for people. So I think further success of Ukrainian democracy undermines Vladimir Putin. People in Russia at some point will see the freedom and prosperity on the other side. Uh, I think some of the other little countries around there, like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, are kind of getting a clue. Uh, and when they see that, they're going to want that. Uh, where, where's our model for that previously? Well, remember, wasn't so long ago that West Germany and West Berlin uh, kind of made East Germany and East Berlin like a, look like a black and white movie, uh, while West Germany looked like, you know, a shining department store with a sale going. Uh, dark, or East Germany was dark and gray. I remember taking the subway into East Germany, and it was just, you know, when you get there and you walk up, you go, like, wow, this place is just run down. That's what made the wall come down in 1989. So further prosperity and democracy in Ukraine will lead, I think, to further uh, decay in 
the Soviet in Russia. And I don't know if that will undermine Putin and bring him down. I just want to remind everybody that the next guy might be worse. You never know what you're going to get. People have asked about his health. So should we have peace talks? Uh, I don't know. Do we want to give land for security? Um, you know, well, the Russian propagandists, like the guy that you presented earlier, they say the goal is the destruction of the Ukrainian nation and their culture and their language. Uh, I don't think that there's going to be a peace talk option here. We'll have to see. Uh, I think a ceasefire would just be used to buy time for the Russians to rearm and go at it again. They got 140 million people. They're all willing to put on uniforms for $2,500, right? Um, the Ukrainians are defending a legal order that they established after the Second World War, and which we should have been supporting better with the United Nations, hasn't been happening, but the West is defending them. Uh, and you know, bottom line, from my point of view, thinking about strategy, Ukraine has performed the NATO mission of absorbing and reversing an attack of Russia. So Russia, instead of attacking NATO, which was why NATO was put together, they attacked Ukraine, and they're getting... Um, pretty much taken down by the Ukrainians. Um, so we're using a tiny percentage of the NATO military budget, the US budget. Uh, we have no losses. We have almost zero casualties from NATO members. Ukrainians are fighting our fight against Russian hegemony. It's a, it's a good thing in a lot of respects. Um, the war will end not because of a sudden event, nor will it go on indefinitely. There, there will be an end at some point. Hard to predict. I can't predict. I was on a Zoom call with Alexander Vindman this morning. He didn't have a good answer. Um, when and how it really ends, from my point of view, depends on what we do now and how much we help. As Anastasia mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of the stuff we supplied was kind of, kind of a little bit late. We, you know, we needed to be all in a lot earlier. So I think ending the war with the Ukrainian victory is by far the best thing for American security. It's the best thing we can do for ourselves. If you look at foreign policy dynamics and the history of foreign policy, there has never been a chance to secure so much peace and security with so little effort. Uh, when we give $40 billion to Ukraine to conduct the war, 70 to 75% of that goes into our economy to build the vehicles, to build the tanks, to build the shells, to all this. So it's actually going to our factories, which is a good thing because most of them were kind of on standby. So we're giving them some of our older stuff and building newer and more modern things. So um, Ukraine is fighting for all of us. Uh, I think we all need to be in this fight. We need to be very, very supportive and not waver. Um, despite the new Speaker of the House. I don't know where he's going with this. We'll talk about that. And I just want to end with the thought, Slava Ukraini, before we start taking on your questions, uh, both from the chat room, and I guess, Matt, people could raise their hand, perhaps, if you want to call on occasion, however you want to do this. So... So, yes, Michael... Um... There is and what we can expect um, um, from his point of view. Uh, maybe we can start there, and then I'll I'll get some other questions. Could you ask me that again, please? Yeah, there's a question regarding the new Speaker of the House and his stance uh, on the Russia-Ukrainian conflict, and. The question is, what will this person bring to American dialogue and what can we expect from him? Well, other than all the negative things that he's bringing to the dialogue, because, you know, he's sort of anti everything that many of us in this uh, group probably are supporting. I'm really worried about his stance on Ukraine. He has vocally and publicly said he doesn't want to spend another nickel in Ukraine, despite the fact that not only is Ukraine fighting for us, but most of that money goes into our own economy. So it's actually a very foolish thing for him to be publicly against supporting Ukraine. And I'm worried. I don't know how many moderate Republicans, I don't even know if there's a, a term that you can use as called a moderate Republican, since they all voted for this guy. Uh, are there enough that will team up with the Democrats to push a funding bill for Ukraine over the line? Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. Maybe he needs to hear from some of us. Um, you know, maybe I'll, I, might start hitting his website every day saying, you know, we need to support Ukraine. They're fighting for us. Maybe I'll try to get him to uh, listen to some of my thoughts about how it actually bolsters American security. If Russia is weaker, it's good for NATO. It's good for the U.S. It's good for the world order. 
Um, but I don't think he gets it. You know, just because you're in Congress doesn't mean you're smart, as we've seen quite a few examples of recently. Uh, but great question. Thank you. So Alan asks, uh, while the Russians underestimated the Ukrainians, the U.S. seems to have underestimated Russia's ability to survive economic sanctions and defend territory it has gained. At what point do we realize that we are in a Korean stalemate situation? At what point do we begin negotiations? Anastasia, you want that a, one? Yeah, I mean, we can both answer it, but I don't think it's an, really a, an appropriate comparison. Uh, I don't think there is, US is not in this war, right? Like Michael is saying, Ukrainians are the ones who are dying every day. And by, and so what we are doing is we're helping them not to die effectively, right? We're not really helping them win. There is no commitment, uh, at least uh, we are standing with Ukraine, right? But there is, you know, there is no American troops on the ground. There is, and no plans to even do that. So, um, so this is one part of this question. The second one is about the peace talks. And uh, we tried to sort of allude uh, in earlier in this conversation, you know, peace talks, everybody, every now and then there is a flare up in the media about how, you know, this war is not going anywhere. It's a stalemate. Let's just uh, get it over with. Uh, that's just not how wars work. I mean, recently we just had it, when was it? I think it, it's September, all of a sudden, uh, there were quotes about, you know, Pope, uh, Ro uh, Roman Pope saying that, you know, we should sue for peace. Uh, nobody is in position to tell Ukraine uh, whether or not they should sue for peace. Uh, they have lost so many lives, uh, so, so much property that uh, if, as a person, as a mother and as a woman, yes, I want peace. I want this war to stop. But that uh, doesn't mean that we should uh, allow Putin basically to change the international law order and take what he wants. Because guess what? Next, there will be, it will embolden a lot of other bad things and war will come here. And then NATO would have to be on the ground if they, you know, and that will be much, much worse. So uh, peace negotiation is really when you when people are asking for peace negotiation they're really repeating uh what the kremlin is trying to do through various sly ways is this yeah they want this war to be frozen at its current state so that they can pull back regroup you know produce more of their uh rusty uh shells on the bread plant and come back again in five, 10 years and really annihilate Ukraine because yes, this is genocide. They do not want Ukrainian nation to exist. Uh, so can you negotiate uh, with a country that made its purpose to annihilate the very, because but they're basically openly saying, Ukrainians are just Russians with broken brains. So we need to reprogram them. We need to re-educate them and so, this is not a situation, unfortunately, where you should be or can be suing for peace. So I very much agree. You know, I've thought about the Korean sort of armistice option. Uh, spent a lot of time in Korea looking at plans, looking at, at how things would go. Uh, and while I was there, there was always incursions. You know, the North Koreans were sending terrorists across the border. They were doing sabotaging things. They sank a Navy ship when I was there and killed some sailors that I personally knew. Uh, they're always provoking. It's not over after all 70 plus years. You know, it's not over. And as they get stronger and Russia perhaps arms them with more modern weapons. And, you know, it, it, who knows what they'll do because, you know, they've got a pretty odd leader uh, di di dynasty, you know, which is very strange. Uh, I think the Russians have to be defeated. They have to be ejected from Ukraine. Ukraine needs to go back to its pre-2014 borders and Russia need, needs to, you know, get out of get out of their territory, but we'll see. I don't even know if that's a feasible endpoint. Good questions, though. So one of the more uh, sobering claims uh, you made, Michael, and I think Anastasia, you agreed, uh, was that 
Russia is actually involved in the conflict in the Russia has a question. She says, how does Russia square its relationship with Iran when the latter has such hatred for the Jewish people in Israel? Aren't there still many Jews in Russia? Well, Anastasia, I'm going to let you answer that, except I want to interject. A lot of their Russian Jews left uh, decades ago when they had a chance. But Anastasia, why don't you take that up for a second? Uh, I mean, Russia has been anti-Semitic anti-Semitic for uh, really a long period of time. And those of you who are of Jewish descent know that pogroms originated uh, in Russia. Yes, things have been changed during the Soviet times because for a while USSR was um, very internationalist and kind of um, there, and, and it actually provided uh, upward mobility for a lot of Jews that until then were uh, confined to the Pale of Settlement and stuff like that. Now, uh, that has changed uh, as the revolution wore off. And by the time I was growing up, it was a pretty anti-Semitic place. Uh, so with Putin's reliance on the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and, and sort of scaling up religion, uh, which it, in their interpretation is an extremely xenophobic, retrograde, traditionalist sort of approach. Uh, it's very natural. In, in fact, there is really little alignment for them with Israel, which is, a, you know, for all its problems, is a liberal, considered a liberal democracy. And they have a much more natural alignment with Iran that is a religious fundamentalist country. And I think that's really what Putin is trying to do with Russia, it, he's changing it to religious fundamentalism. Now, it's not going as well as it did with Iran, but he's just about starting, right? I mean, he, there is more, but this involvement of religion, of Orthodox religion in um, into this war and making Russian Orthodox Church a big part of it, um, it sort of answers uh, why Russia would uh, rather support. And plus, you know, their strategic interest is to sow division here in the West. Look at what's happening with Israeli-Palestine um, news cycle now. It's like this false equivalence between Israel and um, the and and uh, and Hamas that has divided um, United States. Uh, and this division is very beneficial to to Russia. So it's very natural for them to be involved. Thank you. Uh, this will be our last question. Um, thanks to all Ali members who have participated in the chat. Thanks for your comments. Um, if you didn't get your questions answered, um, Michael did say earlier that um, he could respond by email. Um, but here it is. Do you think, Jay asks, that President Biden and the White House should support Ukraine? If not, what could they be doing? Oh, I think they need to be all in. Um, they're, they're fighting our fight. And uh, let me tell you, if, if Ukraine somehow loses ground or loses actually the control of their country, it, it's not over. Uh, Putin's next stop might be Moldova. It might be establishing a land bridge through Lithuania to Kaliningrad. Might be attacking the Baltics. Might be destroying more pipelines to Finland. You know, because they always been fighting the Finns since 1938. So, um, I, I don't. I think we have to be all in. I, I think this prevarication that we're seeing in Congress uh, by people who are fairly uninformed is, is fairly frightening. And uh, we, we need to really be supporting it. Biden and Congress and everybody needs to support Ukraine. I think the question was whether, you know, if, if Biden is effectively communicating that why Americans should be supporting this. And so that's a slight change. Uh, and, and whether they are, I, I feel like he's doing what he can, but uh, our news cycle is relentless. Like people don't, can't hold two conflicts uh, in, uh, you know, in their mind, but uh, the fact that you are here uh, and you care, uh, just keep caring and keep um, explaining your friends and other people you come across with why this is 
really still an existential fight for uh, for our country. It just doesn't feel like it. But uh, as Michael, as a military man knows, in war, things happen, deteriorate quickly. Like one day you uh, think you have it all planned out and, and then next day you don't. So this can happen very quickly. We allow Putin to do what he wants, to erase an identity of a nation simply because he wants to have its territory and resources. So uh, just uh, we have to keep at it and maybe compensate for uh, President Biden probably has a lot of things he needs to communicate to the American people <laughs> and they're not either don't hear him or, um, you know, they're not listening, but we can help. I feel like uh, that's why Michael and I are here on you know Friday afternoon and, and why you are here. So I think it's our common purpose now to, to stay involved and to demand our, uh, while we still, you know, while we have this representative government, uh, to pay attention and to really help Ukraine win as opposed to help it not lose. Th those are two different things. And we should really, at this point, um, understand that we must help it win. Outstanding. Matt, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Um, thank you, Ali at Berkeley. Uh, we wish you uh, a good afternoon um, and take care. Thank you.